Hi, I'm Justin Cassio, and this is How to Genealogy, the second video on interpreting family lore. In the first video in this series, I gave an overview of some types of evidence that are used in genealogy and the importance of using a variety of evidence types in your research. We created a family tree based on our personal recollections, which are a form of primary evidence because you're an expert on the members of your family who you personally know. In this video, I'll be talking about how to use family stories as a source in your genealogical research. Uh, these can be bits of family lore that are talked about when family gets together, or it could be a more formal interview that's been uh, recorded and maybe written up as a report. Uh, it could include obituaries that were written by family members or by colleagues, people who knew the decedent well, uh, or it might be traditional genealogical research that was conducted by one of your relatives and that you want to build on doing your own family tree. I mentioned in the first video that I did not know my paternal grandmother's last name of birth, and I didn't know her parents' names, and I even wrote away for a copy of their marriage record to find that out. But as it turns out, I didn't need to do that. My sister wrote a report uh, some years ago in which she named our grandmother with her last name, uh, and there was more. There was a whole oral history that she had collected by interviewing our great uncle Joseph Cassio. He told her the story of his father, our great grandfather, Leo Luca Cassio, emigrating to the United States when he was a little child. My sister wrote in her report, Louis, that was what uh, Leo Luca was now known as in the United States, he was called Louis. Louis arrived in this country when he was about nine or 10 most likely with his one brother, John, and two sisters, Tilly and Rose, leaving their parents and one sister in Corleo. That's the city in Palermo, Sicily, where our family is from, Corleo. Once the siblings were settled, they sent for their mother to join them in America, but their father had to stay in Sicily for fear that he would not be allowed to pass through the stringent medical tests at Ellis Island. And, and that was a real thing. Uh, if you went to Ellis Island and they determined that you were likely to become a public charge, uh, they would keep you back and send you home again uh, in the worst case scenario. And in that case, the shipping company that had brought you over with a paid ticket, they would have to bring you back at their own expense. So it was in the shipping company's best interests to uh, do that screening at the dock at Palermo rather than bring you all the way to New York to find out that you're gonna get sent back. So Great Uncle Joseph's accounts, they were a good starting point for our research, but let me give you a spoiler alert just right now. It was not a perfect roadmap to finding out all about our family. Like, did you notice that my Italian ancestors all have American names? Uh, what's Tilly even a nickname for? And who was the sister that was left behind. Sometimes sources raise more questions than they answer. It can take several steps and a lot of questions to answer that first question that you had, but along the way you're going to learn a lot and you're going to get answers to lots of questions. Not only are you going to learn a lot about your family, you'll learn a lot about how to do genealogy successfully. Great Uncle Joseph's stories, they were pretty good, but not perfect versions of events. And it's understandable why that would be the case. Joseph would not have known his aunts and uncles by any other names except the names that they used here in America. Uh, so he was a good source on those names, but not so much on their names of birth or their birth order or when they had emigrated, which had all happened before he was born. Records like these oral histories or obituaries, they can often omit these sorts of details. They can omit uh, the names of siblings who died, for instance, or the ones that didn't emigrate with the rest of the family. They simply uh, get lost from the narrative. My great uncle Joseph never knew 
his Aunt Biagia Cassio, the one who stayed behind. And that's why she doesn't get a mention by name. She's just the sister who was left behind. The stories that we tell and preserve in our families, they reflect truths that the family internalizes. They're not usually going to reveal humiliating or damning family secrets. To the contrary, the stories are a reinforcement of values and beliefs that the family treasures and wants to pass down. For example, I corresponded with an elderly gentleman, one of my semi-distant cousins, and he had written an extensive history of his family in Corleone. His uncle, who was also his godfather, was an important mafioso in the mid-20th century. And in 400 pages of this family history, there is not a single mention of the Mafia. He writes about the businesses that his uncle was engaged in, and if you know how the Mafia works, you might realize that he was engaging in black market activity. Uh, he also told me an anecdote about the good relationship that his uncle enjoyed with an even more famous Mafioso. All the same, this gentleman would never come straight out and tell me that his uncle was in the Mafia. To the older generations, to say that somebody was in the Mafia, that was absolutely forbidden. They would never let a story like this be told about the family, because if it's, I mean, think about it, if it's true, it needs to be kept a secret, because it's a secret criminal society. And if it's not true, it's a very embarrassing and possibly dangerous lie to tell about a member of the family. Family secrets are sometimes smuggled down through history anyway. Uh, sometimes a story is allowed to live because it doesn't spill the important details. It just gives an outline, something that you might read between the lines of. And it might be that when the story was originally told, members of the original audience understood that. They knew the parts that were being left out. They could fill in the blanks, but over time, that story is being told to new generations who didn't have that background information. All they get is the story, they don't get the subtext. Through this research, sometimes you can regain that lost information and it can bring new life and depth to a story that you've heard all of your life. Doing genealogy is not easy. I mean, there are mechanical and methodical parts. There is knowledge that can be easily transferred, uh, like where to look for a record. Uh, but the hard part of doing genealogy is knowing what questions to ask. It's being able to ask a question that is answerable with available information. Whether somebody is a member of a mafia is not something that can be directly proven. It has to be done through context and clues because the mafia doesn't keep a list of its membership. It is a secret society. You're not going to find their directory on family search. Uh, and they're not even going to tell you that they're in the mafia. So that leaves the question of how are you supposed to know that great uncle somebody was in the mafia when even they won't tell you that they were in the mafia. And the way you do that is by knowing about their lives and knowing which details match the pattern of what mafiosi do. So that uncle that I was telling you about, the one with the elderly gentleman who wrote a report about him, that fellow, uh, he hung out with famous mafiosi, he engaged in um, black market activity, uh, so he is doing the things that mafiosi do. He's probably a mafioso. And in this particular case, I was able to prove it even more conclusively because he's mentioned in Italian Senate records and American law enforcement knew about him as well. So that is really as much proof as anybody is ever going to get that an individual was in the mafia. And this is what makes family research difficult. What makes This is what makes genealogy challenging, is that you have to bring something to it. It's not just interpreting records in a vacuum. You need to have context and you need to have that human element as well. Sometimes what you need to know is uh, historical and contextual, like 
how the mafia works and what kinds of activities the mafiosi engage in. Um, but sometimes it's about uh, compassion and human psychology, uh, knowing how children think and remember and, and how the emotional content of a story is more important than any of the details, that that's the part that lives. That same gentleman that I was telling you about, he remembers a night long ago when he was a little boy and the police came to his house and arrested one or more of his family members. And there are records of these arrests. They don't all agree on exactly who was arrested. Um, but we do know that there were dozens of Italians who were rounded up right after uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor, which started uh, the American involvement in World War II. And so that was a really scary time for a lot of Italian nationals living in the United States. And in this particular story, we don't know if it was one of his uncles who was arrested, or two, or three, uh, but the point is that because if even just one was arrested, it would have sent the whole family into a state of terror because they would have realized that all of them were vulnerable to the same thing happening to them, that the police could come back at any time and arrest another family member. And that's the part of his story that was so important, uh, why it needed to be passed down in the family, why this gentleman remembered it, and why he was telling that story again. In my own family, there's my great uncle Joseph's account of how his family emigrated here to the United States. And he said that his father, my great-grandfather, Leo Luca Cassio, that he came with his sisters and brother, and that they later sent for their mother. But that's not how it happened. It was actually um, that Leo Luca came over with his mother and his sisters. And later on, another one of his sisters and his brother came. But they didn't come alone. They came two years later with one of their uncles. And I don't have the answers to why they came in that particular order. I don't know uh, why it took two years for them to be reunited, but the emotional content of the story is clear. The message is that my great uncle Joseph's family had to be separated in order to emigrate. And that's the emotional truth that remains in his story. As it turned out, his story also contained details that were accurate and that allowed me to find the family in vital records and to confirm parts of his story. Uh, clarify other parts, and enrich the whole of it uh, so that his story becomes a part of a much larger and more uh, complicated story. In future videos, I'm going to come back to this story and I'll show you how to use those vital records to find your own family and confirm the details of the family stories that you've had passed down to you. We'll go over the open issues, all those questions that you've been collecting, and figure out how to formulate questions that the vital records can answer. Did you like this video? Oh, I hope you did. Uh, please click like and subscribe to this channel if you'd like to see more of them. Uh, I want to give a special shout out to my Patreon supporters. And if you enjoyed this video, you found it informative, you found it interesting, I hope you will consider also supporting Mafia Genealogy on Patreon.